I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. Uh, John Tuttle, and I was born August 26, 1946. As far back as I can remember, I just had this little glimpse of my dad, but I didn't get to know my dad very well because uh, he was in World War II, and uh, he was in the Navy, and he was a machinist mate, but they ended up having him be a motorman in the South Pacific, and he would drive Marines in and leave them off, and then they'd bring back wounded and dead and put them on the, and he had to take them back to the ship. And uh, he never got over that. When he came home, I guess I was four or five, but he took the car out in the country and he put a hose in the back window and gassed himself. So I never really knew my, my dad, pretty much my stepdad. It was the one that I knew all, all most of my life. Kind of called him dad anyway, he was my dad. I was always fascinated with uh, military things, you know, growing up, I just loved to watch the world at war and stuff like that about World War II and stuff. So it, was, it was always fascinating to me. And so it was natural for me, I guess, when I got into um, high school to get involved with um, NDCC at Auburn or ROTC as, as, as it's called now. But uh, yeah, I was in that program all the time I was in high school. Uh, wanted to go to school. I, I thought, well, yeah, I'll go to school. So my, uh, I did finally enroll and went to uh, University of Iowa in Iowa City. One semester, that's all I made. I ended up dropping out after one semester. I got called into Chicago about three times to get uh, to um, get a physical. So I went in there three times and uh, went for the physical and I figured, uh oh, they're gonna keep me one of these times. This was before draft numbers, so I didn't know what was gonna happen. So I, the third time I said, okay, I'm just gonna enlist. So I went ahead and enlisted. Ended up, we went to Fort Knox for basic training. So we went through all that and that was, that was something else. A lot of fun, though. I mean, those sergeants just have more fun with you than you can imagine. And you're all gullible kids. You don't know any better. But what's amazing is when it's over, those same sergeants suddenly become human beings. Because I was held over for about a week waiting for my orders. But I ended up at uh, Fort Knox in the Allied Officer Training Department as a training aid specialist. And that was good, except that I developed a few bad habits because Louisville was only 30 miles away and I could go there every weekend. One year left in the service, and I remember Sergeant Marshall telling me, he says, you know, Tuttle, you're a soldier 24 hours a day. Sure, sir, I understand. Of course I didn't. With one year left exactly, I got my, um, I was levied and I got my notice that I was going to be sent to Vietnam. So that's when that started, when they went to Vietnam and, and uh, yeah, that was interesting. You know, didn't really particularly want to go, wasn't real happy about being an infantry soldier, but that's what I was, so I got to do my job. I remember going to Fort Dix and for the flight over there and uh, Fort Dix, if you don't know anything about it, there's a street that goes into the main entrance and right near where the bus stops, there must be about a dozen bars. That's all there are, bars lined up with each other. So I went in there and I 
drank up all the money I had, whereupon I took my duffel bag and walked over to Fort Dix and checked in. I don't know how I did that, but I did it. And uh, it was, what, a couple days, and next thing I know, I'm on a plane and ended up landing and uh, went to Alaska, then uh, Jakota Air Force Base in Japan, and then landed in Saigon. And next thing I know, I'm on a bus for Lai K. And I'm in the 1st Infantry Division. So there I was at Lai K with them. And it was really interesting because I met these guys and so many of them had 9th Infantry patches on because they'd been down in the Delta. I was always pretty good with, uh, with weapons. I mean, I sharpshooter with uh, small arms and I was an expert on the machine gun, so that wasn't a problem. We, we trained with the M14s, but uh, when we got to Vietnam, of course, what, there was about a couple days they trained you and they handed you an M16 and you learned how to use that. That wasn't hard at all, they're nice weapons. But anyway, um, at, uh, uh, I was sent to the 1st Infantry Division, the 1st 16th Mech Infantry out of Lai K which is in the three core area north of Saigon. They call it the Parrot's Beak. And uh, our unit was, was all over, three core. Because we were mech infantry, we could go anywhere. So we, we did. We were everywhere. From north of, of Saigon all the way up to the Cambodian border. And as far west as Kuchi and as far east as Ubai. And it, it just seemed like we were everywhere. And most of the time, being a Spec 4, I didn't know where we were. Nobody ever told me. <laughs> I didn't really know. They just blow them up, move it out. And uh, um, I wasn't there very long. And we loaded up and we went north. We went through um, um, An Lok and Lok Nin. And it, we were all, all, all the way to I don't know where. We were somewhere. I suppose we were close to Cambodia, if not in Cambodia. The scariest part was when we, um, I hadn't been there very long, and uh, we went north. And the biggest thing you had to worry about with mech infantry was mines. Because we could go across an area and you could feel it, you, you knew it was there. The tracks always followed each other, 113s, one, one, so, you know, the personnel carriers. You didn't ride inside, you rode on top because the inside was full of ammo. It was a rolling ammo dump. We had everything in there, claymores, machine gun ammo, so we rode on top. And, uh, and you'd be sitting there going, oh, there's, there's mine out there. Somebody's going to get it because the tracks followed each other in each other's tracks. And there, you know, we'd have a column, 36 tracks, a whole battalion or something there. And uh, they put out these pressure mines. They had a pressure device on them. And so first track would go over, might blow up, might not. It might take 12 tracks before the darn thing would blow up. We'd look up, all of a sudden there'd be an explosion. You'd see a cloud rise. They'd drag that track out of the way and we'd all keep going. So you never knew what was going to happen. That was the only time I ever smoked. And uh, we finally got to where we were going. And uh, that ended up being pretty tough. I know that time we were going to do blocking things up in the north because um, in the three core area in the north were infiltration routes from the um, Ho Chi Minh Trail where they'd come in through there and they'd go south uh, through the um, they go south, get in the Michelin rubber plantation, and go further south and try to get into the Iron Triangle and then work their way into Saigon or whatever. So um, our job was to stop them, and um, that was pretty ugly. We, of course, had the tracks as a, at a perimeter, like we set up a perimeter with the tracks, and then we were dismounted and we were going through jungle area, and uh, we ran into small arms fire and sniper fire. It was pretty pretty heavy. Um, it just it just kept coming. The whole battalion pretty much held down by um, fire and uh, sniper fire and everything else and I can remember uh, 
lay him waiting for my turn because they just say, you guys, down that trail, go get him. And uh, they move out, and the next thing we know, here's some more guys coming back, and, and they're on, you know, on stretchers and stuff. Uh, I remember laying there, waiting for my turn to go down to move out and go down there. And we're, I'm laying next, there's several of us just waiting for our turn. And they called in air power. So they called in jets and these jets are coming over and dropping, dropping bombs and uh, laying there. And I'm laying right next to this guy and all of a sudden he just screamed. He's just screaming out of mad because a piece of, uh, you know, his shrapnel had went in the back of his leg as we were laying there. And uh, man, that was a that was a first experience with that. And then uh, then we finally got up and got online, and we're just going through the jungle. And that's that was the first time I saw a uh, a soldier that had been uh, killed, and it was kind of hard to take. And I mean, it was just hard because I I saw him. Was, there was a stretcher laying there. And uh, they'd thrown him on the stretcher. He was thrown on a stretcher and they pulled his shirt over his head because he'd been shot through the head. I remember looking at him and just going, God, he looks just like me. <laughs> just, just a guy like me. And I remember taking his arms and just laying him over that and then just moving out and going on. But uh, that in effect just made you realize, I think we lost, our company lost about six guys there at that, uh, in that situation there. But uh, yeah, that's kind of hard when you see stuff like that. And, yeah, stuff like that. And, yeah, that was one of the worst things. And then, and uh, that was not a good time. That was pretty hard. One of the nights we were up there, I was on an ambush patrol. And our ambush patrol was set up right at the edge of the trees in the jungle there and we were set up next to tall trees it's almost like a clearing beyond us and we were laying there and then all of a sudden that night of course you you, you know an ambush patrol is easy you each take turns you know there's about eight of you and you just lay out and one person has a starlight scope they stay awake until it's turned to pass it on so they're just just keep sweeping the area looking for anything uh, we didn't see anything all night, but right there about, I don't know what time in the night it was, the middle of the night sometime, they started walking mortars into us. Humpa, humpa, humpa. And they're getting closer and closer. And you can hear the stuff flying through the, through the trees and the leaves and stuff, and you're thinking, oh, Lord, please stop it. I don't want to. And, and it did. They finally stopped, and we're going, that's so great, that stuff. But uh, oh, that was one of the worst times, I guess, is up there. And then we finally went back. And I can remember when we were doing road security, being on an ambush patrol that night. And uh, boy, that was one of the creepiest things, because you see, I was in a pretty strack unit. We always had our weapons. We always had our flak jackets on, had our helmets. Whenever we went anywhere, we looked good. We didn't look bad. Um, at any rate, we were doing road security, had to go on an ambush patrol at night. And uh, I know, we're out in the ambush patrol. You didn't expect a lot. You had your starlight scope. Most of the time, there wasn't much going on. You didn't see anything. You, you're out there with uh, six to eight guys, and what you do is you lay in a you're in the jungle or you're in the high grass or wherever you happen to be, you just lay there and take turns with the starlight scope. Everybody else is asleep and you're, it's your two hours and you're looking around and, and uh, trying to see what's out there, if anything's out there. Pretty soon little bushes start looking like they got little hats on and everything else is crazy. You're staring there, oh, wait, but what is that? <laughs> Every little sound, what's that? You know? And. Uh, we're walking through this area before it gets dark and we kind of set up along this old abandoned railway. It was kind of built up in high grass area. And so we just laid down in there waiting for it to get dark and we'd move to our final position. Okay, so we're laying there and all of a sudden, bam, 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 bam. <laughs> it's lit up, everything flying everywhere. And guys, a couple of guys in front of me were running over the top of me and jumping down and uh, next thing you know, we're just, we just start shooting like mad, machine guns going and, and, uh, 
And Cowboy or Platoon Sergeant, he, well, he was, uh, he was with us that night. He says, get those hand grenades, throw them over the railroad tracks. You don't know where they're coming. So we're doing that. And I had a thump gun at that time, grenade launcher. And he said, put some rounds out there. Boom, boom, boom. Start popping the HE rounds out that direction and stuff. And the machine guns are shooting. Um, don't know what it was. All we can figure out is that this was a point guy and he'd walked right into our ambush patrol. We didn't, we, you know, we didn't know whether there were a whole bunch of them coming or what, but apparently he was a point guy and he, he didn't get anybody though. That was truly amazing. He unloaded that AK-47, I think, and never hit anybody. That was, that was truly amazing. You know, the, the days kind of ran together after a while. You just did, uh, you were, you, your, your day was like this. Okay, you would be on the track doing track security, or you would be an observation post sitting out in the jungle or out in the uh, grasses somewhere, or you would be doing some security around the perimeter where the tracks were parked, or you were on a sweep search destroy whatever they had going. You know, something like that was going on all day. You were doing something. And then at night, it was the same way. You were on a track doing security. You were out there doing a listening post, or you would be doing some perimeter uh, guarding, or you're on an ambush patrol. And that's the way it went, day after day after day after day, always the same. So it just, you know, you, you, it went on and on like that. And, you reach a low point, at one point I just, I just kind of resigned to the fact that I'd probably never go home again. And then, it, 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 uh, something really incredible happened to me. Um, and I still don't fully understand what was going on. All, I don't remember any details about that day, except that I found myself in the company tent. And I don't know why. I don't know whether it's trouble or why I happened to be there. I have no idea. I, all of a sudden, I'm standing there. And I can remember looking across the tent. And there's a guy standing over there. And I'm standing over here. And all of a sudden, a helicopter comes in. A helicopter lands. And through the entrance comes this big bear of a guy. And he walks over to that guy on the other side of the tent. And he put a bear hug on him. And so I'm, I look the other way. The next thing I know, he's in my face. He looked me in the eye, put a big bear hug on me, and he said, God loves you, son. You're going to be okay. Now, I don't know if he's a chaplain or what, because he was gone. But that experience, I was. I was okay. I was going to be okay. Because, I, you know, I mean, you're worried about that. Were you going to live another day, or was something going to happen? What was going to blow up? What was going to happen? You never knew. And it went on like that for, for most of the time. But you always feel bad about, you know, some of the guys you left behind. And I think we had a rep because we go places and nothing would happen. But sometimes it did. And probably the other worst thing that I can remember is two tracks were blown up. They were melted down to nothing. They were aluminum, you know. The tracks were gone and all the bodies were gone, dusted off. And one of them had cowboy on it. That's my platoon sergeant. He was like my big brother. I mean, I loved that guy. He was great. And uh, I don't, I didn't know what happened to him. I never knew what happened to him. I often wondered what, what happened to cowboy? You know, what happened to him? Nobody ever told us, we didn't know. Uh, I didn't know if he was alive, if he survived it, or, you know, if he was just, totally gone. You know, some people act like all we did was drink beer and smoke pot, but uh, um, we did, we did, well, our unit was pretty strict about beer. They didn't want us drinking beer very much. There was pot. I can remember smoking that, but um, it wasn't every day or anything like that. But I can remember we had a stand down at Xeon uh, Zeon's right near Lyk, and uh, they had a Filipino band, and we're all in there, and we all drank too much. And next thing you know, there's a fight going on. Everybody's punching everybody. I got four stitches over my eye here. I went down, Big Buddy from uh, 
California, Mickey, I can't remember his last name. He grabbed me and pulled me out. <laughs> I appreciated that. You know, something that happened is just, like I say, we were pretty strack units, so they didn't mess with us too much, but once in a while, somebody gets shot, something around, sniper, uh, a firefight, they didn't stay long. They would leave, because, you know, you're, your 113 had a 50 caliber machine gun in the center and two 60s out either side when you're on the road. So they didn't like to mess with us. They might fire an RPG and run, or yeah, mortars were probably the worst thing. Uh, small arms fire once in a while, but not too often. Like I say, if they did anything like that, they'd be gone because the fire power that we could unleash on them was, was, was incredible. You know, with 50 calibers all of a sudden <laughs> tearing the jungle up, the 60s going like mad and everybody with their small arms firing in that direction. And that, that was part of the problem a lot of times. You, you never saw people, you just saw bushes shooting at you or something coming out of the ground or something, you never really saw it. So you just, just start blowing that up, whatever was over there. And, then, and you might find something, you might not. They might DD mile out of there, you know, they're gone. <laughs> but you never knew. better part of a month or so, maybe a month, month and a half. And then we'd come back and do maintenance on the tracks and then head back out again, you know, wherever they wanted to send us. Oh yeah, we saw some. Uh, most of the time though, you know, if you got in a firefight or something, you never saw anybody. It was usually bushes and <laughs> things shooting at you. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't see anybody. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and we never really had to recover a lot of bodies or anything. In fact, the worst thing that happened was, and I didn't happen to be there, is uh, um, I was back at, I was doing something else that day, but they were out on a sweep, part of our, our company was out on a sweep, and uh, they found a whole squad of Viet Cong that had been shot by gunship or something, and their bodies were all laying there in the sun, rotten and terrible, and they made them, they said, okay, go search them. Go find any paperwork, anything you can on them. And I can still remember this little skinny guy that was in our unit. I can't even remember his name now. But he only weighed 90 pounds. He was a tall, little skinny guy from Arkansas. But, I mean, he, uh, I remember he came back and he just washed his hands, and washed his hands, and washed his hands. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't get over it. It was pretty hard on him. We had various duties um, as a mech unit. Sometimes we'd do road security on Thunder Road, which was Highway 13 North. And uh, we'd just go s sweep the road and then do security, set tracks up along the road and do that. You can see chain link fence on the front of those. We had to do that. We'd stop, put chain link fence up. And what the, what's that for? That was to stop RPGs. When we were in a stationary mode where we set up, RPG, a rocket, would go through that chain link fence and get caught by the fence and stop. It would stop it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't penetrate it. So, I mean, <laughs> that was crazy, huh? Yeah, I can remember once we hit a, we hit a, a booby trap and it blew the track off, the one side of the track. And when that track got blown off, um, the guy sitting on the side where the track was, they all had perforated eardrums. Uh, I was sitting on the other side, and all, my ears just rang for about four days, but I got over it. And um, they were going to seal this one village, and the track went like that. And I, I got thrown off, and I landed on my face, and, my, and I broke a tooth out. So I got a bridge here. That's my, that's my VA claim right there. And, uh, and my tooth was hanging in there. And they said, well, you got, we got, you got to do something about that. I said, why? They said, we're going to send you back to like, no, you don't need to dust me off. So they dust me off, send me back to like, hey, I get to like, hey, and there's a bed. I get to sleep in a bed, you know? I mean, uh, oh, that was so nice because we sleep on the crown all the time. And if one of the luxuries was to be able to sleep in the track, that was nice. But so, so I got to sleep in the, in the bed. So I, I went to bed and I woke up in the morning and I go to see the dentist and, 
And the dentist looks at my mouth. He says, oh, my God, how could you sleep? I said, well, there's a bed. He says, well, how could, that's just hanging there by the nerve. How could you do that? I don't know. So it was nice to sleep in the bed. So, so they took care of that. And that was that. And back with my unit again. Oh, yeah, about three months left. And they said, tell them we're going to send you a helicopter loading school. You're going to be doing resupply for the company. That was interesting, loading and unloading helicopters. It was, it was a really neat experience because that, that was nice. You just throw the donut on the hook and away it goes, or, you, or they drop the load and you load it into the camel. We had this camel, it's like a covered wagon track, a track with a covered wagon uh, on the back. And uh, we could do everything with that. We'd go around and pick everything up around the perimeter and we'd take uh, you know, trash to the dump that was that was fun. We'd go around, pick up all the trash around with that camel, and uh, and then we'd take the camel up and back up to this big hole the engineers had dug right outside this village, and uh, start throwing the stuff in in the back of the track. Well, guess what? The whole village was in the in the hole, <laughs> and they would start fighting over pieces of meat and everything else that were dropped out in there. You know, they'd grab everything. It was unbelievable. And when we'd take the track and pull it up on the hill, uh, just away from there, and here'd come the kids. There'd probably be anywhere from a dozen to 20 kids and they'd jump on the track. Okay, and then we'd take the track down to the river to clean it out after doing all that. So we'd take it down to the river and clean it out and throw the kids in the water and have fun. That was kind of neat. Oh, and then another thing when I was doing resupply that I remember was, you know, I, I was really proud to be part of the 1st Infantry Division because we treated people right. We treated the Vietnamese right wherever we went, um, even when we have to search a village or something. And uh, the Arvins were taking over more and more um, of the duties that we had, the Army of South Vietnam. So we. We saw those guys all the time, giving them peace signs and stuff. Hey, <laughs> and uh, we had, you know, we had a scout that was Arvin and stuff. So it was, it was, it was good. Things were really good. I remember once uh, I had to take the deuce and a half, and that was, that was darn right scary. First of all, they told me I'd, I'd rather be a line combat soldier than drive that deuce and a half. Because number one, when they gave me the deuce and a half, it had three flat tires. So they said, take it to the motor pool there in Lake and put some, uh, you're going to have to put some, you're going to have to get those fixed. So I go in there and they said, well, you just do this, this. And I said, oh, no, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I'm just, they just made me a driver. I don't know anything about this. They said, well, besides that, be careful of those split rings because if those come off, they'll chop your head off. Oh, oh great. Wonderful. Well, at any rate, with a little help, I got all three fixed and got the thing running. And then we get back there and they said, well, you know, you're going to have to make a run up north there. But uh, be careful. We'll send somebody with you because uh, we've had some rounds and stuff coming in there. And I thought, oh, great. I'd rather be a combat soldier laying with my squad than sitting in that truck as a doggone sitting duck, you know, just waiting for somebody to blow you away. That was terrible. I, that, I, that, was, that was worse than, like I say, being a combat soldiers in a stupid truck like that. The worst one I saw was a uh, big guy. He was a big guy. I can't, Mal Malik, Malik, I can't remember his name for sure, but he was, he was um, when I was doing resupply and stuff, we got mortared. The mortars started flying in. So we just jumped under the camel and we're laying on the ground there. And he had <laughs> this guy, this big old guy building <laughs> He had a cot and he built some sandbags all around it. Well, he just laid down in there. Well, unfortunately, a mortar round landed practically on top of him. And it, yeah, yeah, it was bad. He just, there wasn't, you could see right through him. There wasn't much left of him. And his cot was full of blood. And I'll never forget that smell because um, that never went away. He just sat there in the sun and that's an awful smell. But there wasn't much left of him. Oh, geez. Then we had a driver that got hit by an RPG. 
I remember that one. Um, he got hit by an RPG, came right through the uh, track. And uh, there wasn't much left of him. He was all burned up. So all, he had, all they had left of him was bones. And I can remember the first sergeant showed us a flag. I said, what's that, Sarge? He said, that's, that's him. He's in there. His bones are in there. We just wrapped him up in there because we didn't have nothing else for him. So. Firebase Hurtigan had to be torn down and taken out because didn't need it anymore. So I can remember we just working and working, loading stuff, getting stuff, taking stuff down. And finally, I just fell asleep. And I, I can remember I woke up and all of a sudden I thought I was in hell because around the perimeter, they had these 55 gallon drums filled with foo gas and they had detonators on them from uh, like you'd use on a claymore so you could ignite them. And they were all around the perimeter. So if the perimeter was ever overrun, eh, there you go. Well, they fired all that off at once. And all you could see was fire all around the edge of that fire base. And you could feel the heat too, it was unbelievable. And then the only other thing I had to do was, um, I had to run up on, uh, they had these towers that, what, what were they, about 20 feet tall or 25 feet tall. And you have these timber towers set in the middle of every little fire base. So you could have watch up on the tower there all around. And uh, so this had to be taken out. So I had to run up on top, put the straps on that thing, and then wait for the flying crane to come in and throw the hook on the flying crane and, and get that out. I, I got out 15 days early because the 1st Infantry Division was already cutting back and they would, they would be out of the country in 1970, so this was 69, so they were already cutting back and they gave me, I got to go home 15 days early. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I never got to go to Saigon except going and coming and uh, got to go to um, Benoit, what was it, Benoit? Yeah, Benoit Airfield and that's where the airplane flew out of that or was it Long Ben? I don't know, one of them. But anyway, the airplane flew out of there. 707, complete with a stewardess and, and uh, it was just a regular 707. You know, you get on the plane. I remember they gave me a bunch of garbage because my boots were never shined. Well, they never were shined. Who, sh who had time to shine anything? We never went to town. We never. We were out in the boonies all the time. So this old sergeant's giving me garbage about it. So I said, give me some polish. I don't have any polish. So he gave me some polish and I remember rubbing them on there and making them black. And I says, there you go. You gotta leave me alone, damn it. <laughs> So I was getting on the plane and I can remember sitting down on the plane and uh, um, there was music playing and the plane went up and you could look down, see these potholes and stuff and then all of a sudden the clouds came in and it was gone. And I just sat there and I laughed and laughed and laughed. And they came back and said, are you all right? Are you all right? Oh yeah, I'm great. This is wonderful. <laughs> I'm leaving it. A lot of guys couldn't do that, but I did. I left it. My wife says I didn't completely. She, um, she says there were things you did that, <laughs> well, I guess I had a little bit of that PTSD, I guess, when I came home. Loud sounds and I'd be on the ground. <laughs> um, I'd go someplace, I'd want to be able to see the door, you know, so I could, I'd, I'd want my back on the wall, I could see the door and stuff, and you know, I was just worried about anybody behind me or something. And... You know, when I came home, um, I, I, I went to um, Oakland, you know, and I was discharged right there, because my last year, I was last year non. And I can remember, um, getting on the plane, uh, not much. It's just that people would kind of, you know, they didn't like look at you much or want to talk to you, it seemed like, or anything like that, you know. I did sense there wasn't too much anybody wanted to talk about or anything. And I remember taking all my stuff and putting it in the back of the closet. And I left it there for about 30 years. <laughs> Never, never talked about it or anything much.
didn't want to. Yeah. When I got back, went to Rock Valley, and uh, they had great vets club then. It was great. Yeah, it was good times. A lot of support from me, fellow fellow soldiers that way. So it was a good time. I was in a class at RVC with a man that was very big on anti-Vietnam war protesting. And in fact, I was under the understanding that he was the leader in this community of the anti-war movement. And he was in a lot of protest marches and sit down. I was in speech class with him. And I avoided speech class all through high school because I didn't like public speaking. I didn't like talking in front of people. Um, so here I am in college and I'm just as afraid and just as nervous about it. And, um, you know, of course, all his speeches, and he had a bunch of cronies that were in class with him, and all their speeches were all anti-war speeches. And, and my speech, um, I think it was my final speech or something, it was an important one for a big grade, um, I gave up and I, I corresponded with a couple of guys in Vietnam. And um, one of them had sent me this poem. It was entitled, uh, Who Gives a Damn What a Soldier Gives? And it was, you know, just kind of an anti-protest protest. And that was the last line in the poem, is, you know, like, who gives a damn what a soldier gives? And the, everybody in the speech class was like, it was silent. It was like, nobody said anything. And it was, you could hear a pin drop, literally. And that was kind of like, whoa, I got Bob Cheadle, was his name, to shut up. You know, because he was always talking anti-war stuff. So when he, you know, when I met him, it was just, it was just accepted, it, you know. I knew he was a vet. I knew he was from Vietnam. There wasn't anything really different, you know, about it. So it was just, just what was going on in 1969, 1970, so. And I finally got my welcome home from Vietnam in Mount Morris on the 4th of July. See, our, our American Legion group wears the fatigues we wore when we were in the service. So we got guys from the 50s and 60s and 70s, even, you know, 90s, that are wearing the type of fatigues they wore when they were in. So I always wore my jungle fatigues. Okay, so you're marching through the streets. And all of a sudden people are clapping and saying, thank you, thank you. That was my official welcome home party. And then, like I say, when I retired, it just felt like, I guess I'm supposed to help veterans. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's why I keep going. They keep getting me there. <laughs> they just keep going that way. So, yeah. One day I was doing escort. They get a phone call. I said, hey, there's a guy up in, uh, there's a veteran. He's, uh, he's passing away. He's up in uh, surgical intensive care unit. He wants to talk to another veteran. Send somebody up here. So the other three guys said, oh, I'm not going up there, I'm not going up there. You go up there. So I ended up going up there. All the way up there, I'm saying, Lord, give me words. I hope I can speak to this guy. I get up there, and uh, he's sitting there, and his head's back. His breathing's not the best, and uh, you can tell he doesn't have much longer for this world. So what do you do? Hmm? What do you do? You take his hand. And you say, I'm here for you, brother. What can we, hey, how you, I know it's not easy. This is, this is hard. I don't know what's going to happen. I said, you, you, you know, but you, just relax and take it easy. You know what? They said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a veteran just like you. It doesn't make any difference when we served, where we served, branch we were in. What we did doesn't make any difference. We're brothers, and we got a common bond that, that we understand, don't we? Yeah. And I'm here for you, buddy. We'll just we'll just sit here. We'll be, we're going to be okay. You just relax and let it go. You're going to be fine. And, and uh, I can remember uh, uh, just talking some more about that, where he was, and maybe what he did, and just say, you know, it's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if you ever ran around beating people up with a Bible or not, but I'll bet sometime in your life you called on the Lord. Say, you know what? He's waiting for you. You're going to be okay. He's waiting for you. 
and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be more wonderful than anything you can imagine. Just, just let it go. You're going to be okay. And I can remember then, um, said a prayer with him, still holding his hand. Said a prayer with him, and uh, he was gone. He, uh, he passed away right there, and man, that broke me up. And what really broke me up wasn't the fact that you know I hadn't seen somebody die before or that he was dead. What tore me up, I guess, the most was that there wasn't anybody there for him except me and the nurse. And I think that really got to me. I came back a week later and uh, oh, I, was, I was back up at Madison a week later and I, I look over and here's a little card. And it was a card from the nurse. <laughs> and uh, that made me cry again because she said, thank you, John, for proving such a wonderful service to a veteran in need on Friday, on January 29th. You spoke such wonderful words and comforted this veteran in his final moments, which is something we wouldn't have been able to do. Um, thank you for showing us what a veteran bond looks like, even in death. You truly are an angel, and that veteran was so very lucky. I fucking broke up about this. So very lucky to have you by his side in the end. Kristen, our end. So that, you know, it just really broke me up. But uh, I just figured that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know. Because like I said, he never talked to um, our kids about stuff. And it, it wasn't until he got involved with um, different vets groups that he started talking about any of any of this stuff and and that's you know that's part of his past that's part of his life that you know he's dealt with maybe privately uh, all these years so just talking to people and this that's what this program has done is you know gotten these guys that haven't talked to people and shared things we heard in uh at Vietnam, that they found the remains of Alan Boyer. Alan Boyer is what our hall is named after, Alan Boyer. He was a Green Beret in Laos in 1968, and his unit came under really terrific heavy fire and everything else. And helicopter came in and got the team out, and uh, everybody except him. He was the last one, and he'd made sure all these guys were on the, on the uh, helicopter, and he, he was the last one. He, the last time they saw him, it was hanging on a rope and, uh, or a cable or whatever they have on a helicopter. That was the last time anybody saw him, and then they never saw him again. And, uh, and so he was, that was 1968. Well, in March of this year, they found Alan's remains, and they were sent to uh, Arlington Sem National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. So about five of us guys, well, three of us jumped in my car and decided it was going to be June 22nd. So three of us jumped in my car and drove straight to Washington on the 21st, got there at night. Um, and we met two other guys there. And so there's five of us in this motel room. And uh, it was like being in the barracks again, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was okay. So we all got dressed up the next morning and we went to the interment of Allen. And it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. Occasionally somebody gets picked off or something happens, you know? And so you're thinking, Lord, I don't think I'm gonna get out of here. We lost 25 guys out of my company when I was over there. And uh, that's the other thing that I forgot to tell you about. You know, I brought in that gear. When we were in Washington for Allen, well, in March, I went to the virtual wall because I always, like I said, I never knew guys' names. And I went to the virtual wall and I found my unit and I found the dates and there they were. When we were up near Cambodia, here's the six guys, there's their names. The six guys, where they were from and everything about them. And I'm going, oh my gosh, that's... So I wrote their names down. And then I, I could see where we got in a firefight and there were five guys there. 
And then when the two tracks were blown up, the guys that were lost there, and then the other guys that were lost later. And so I wrote them all down. I'm going, oh my God. So I carry that with me. I've always got that list with me right here. I carry that with me, all 25 names. Okay, I got them. Yeah. And then so I, I got all those names. So this was in March. So we went to Washington in June while I carried my jungle fatigues, my heart, uh, you know, my, my uh, helmet and my gear. And that night after the internment of Alan, back there about 10 o'clock at night, I put on my gear and I drove to the wall and I had made 25 cards like this. These are all my guys. That's a picture of one of the tracks with Cowboy there. Here's Cowboy with a cup of coffee and all of us standing around him. There we are standing on tracks getting ready to move out. And uh, I, it, on here it says, I was there with you and I will always remember you. Rest in peace, brother, T-Bone. And I took a card like this and I put each one of the 25 names on it, maybe wrote a little something. And so that night I went to the wall and I had my cards. Oh, I did 22 cards <laughs> right here. Even though I didn't know most of these guys, they're from Ogle County. These are the 22 guys that were lost in Vietnam in Ogle County. And even though I didn't know them personally, I knew a lot about them because over the years I've known so many of the people, relatives and stuff. So I, I made a card for each one of them. And this one says, um, Ogle County Fallen Soldiers Memorial, that's the thing for it. And it says, um, we, your family's brothers and sisters in arms, will never let the world forget the sacrifice you made. There, here, and at our memorial at home, you will always be remembered. Rest in peace, brother. So I made one of those for each one of them. 22, 25. So I went to the wall at 10 o'clock at night. And I go, oh, what was neat on the virtual wall is it tells you what line and what panel they're on. So you can find them. So that's what I did. I went to each each one of them. First I went to Tony Belletti, and I went to the wall, put my hand on Tony's name. Some of them I couldn't reach because they're too high on the wall, but I put my hand on Tony's name, and I just said a little prayer for him and dropped the card. And I did that for all 25 and then all 22 of these guys. And I was balling most of the time. It was a big, big baby, you know, but, but it was neat to be there at night because I didn't have to, you know, not a lot of people there, just a few people. So it was kind of neat. That was, that was something I always wanted to do for almost 50 years. <laughs> go, go say goodbye to all those guys. So I just really felt good that that all worked out. Yeah. Some characters, I'll tell you. They stay with you. You never leave them. You know, I, was, I got a copy of uh, that picture of the wall. Have you ever seen that picture of the guy leaning against the wall with his hand on the wall? A lot of people don't really understand it. Yeah, well, they do, they get the main idea. But the thing is, he's standing with his hand on the wall and in his mind, of course, his buddies all come to life and he sees them because he's looking at their names. But you see, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is they come alive there because they're always with him. They never go away. They're always in his head. He'll never forget them. They're always there. So when he's there, because see, you, you, it never goes away. There, you're always there. There comes back all the time, you know? You never, it never goes away. And those guys never go away. You can't always see them. And so when he's on the hand on the wall, yeah, I see what happened. You can see them. They're still there. <laughs> They never really go away. Oh, I just want to add one thing. Tell them what we did after on our 44th anniversary there. Remember? We went We went to, uh, I said, get in the car. We're going someplace. Oh. I didn't tell her where. We went up to Rock and, Valley. And, yep, and, went to uh, Rock Valley. And she finally figured it out. We got to Rock Valley. And then we walked uh, down past uh, the old farmhouse, down to by the, the lagoon. lagoon. There's a rock by the lagoon. Some people that went to Rock Valley know what it is, but it's it's got a plaque on it. 
and it says, kiss till the cows come home. We used to go sit there. When it we was called the Blarney yeah. Stone when we were in college. <laughs> Take a man, put him alone, put him 12,000 miles from home. Empty his heart of all the blood, make him live in sweat and mud. This is the life I have to live, and why my soul to the devil I give? You peace boys rest easy in your chair, but you don't know what it's like over here. You have a ball without even trying, while over here boys are dying. You burn your draft card, march at dawn, plant your signs on the White House lawn. You all want to ban the bomb. There's no real war in Vietnam. Use your drugs and have your fun, then refuse to use a gun. There's nothing else for you to do. And I'm supposed to die for you? I hate you till the day I die. You made me hear my buddy cry. I saw his leg a bloody shred. I heard them say, this one's dead. It's a large price he had to pay not to live another day. He had the guts to fight and die. He paid the price. But what did he buy? He bought your life by losing his. But who gives a damn what a soldier gives? His girl and his mom. But they're the only ones.
Veterans have been through hell in one way, shape, or form, and they have given something up for this country. They go through rigorous training to break them down and build them back up into a soldier, marine, sailor, or airman ready to answer the call for their country. Through this training, a brotherhood is formed between them, no matter the branch, and they would die for the person standing next to them without hesitation. This brotherhood is what gets them through some of the most horrific and emotional events. When they come home, they're expected to readjust to civilian life and go about their day like nothing had ever happened. With this class, we extend out a brotherhood to veterans to bring them in as family. Small actions sometimes mean the most. Something as simple as just listening means the world because brotherhood not only brings branches together, it brings generations together. This is what I've grown to appreciate from John since the first day I met him at a Vietnam veterans event that the class went to a little over a year ago. Having already begun to understand the scope of the class, I knew that I was gonna complete a doc for one of the vets I had met that day. I find one of the hardest parts about this class is choosing only one vet you will do a doc on because the lessons learned and stories to be told and heard are so infinite. I remember the very first interview I led was with John and a friendship was instantly born. I would look for him at events to talk with him and listen to the experiences he had to share. At the beginning of last year, I joined the military to serve in the army. I met with John several times after I had made this decision and our friendship turned into a bond that reached out through the generations and connected us. When I came home after basic, having a little taste of what our vets went through, my understanding and compassion grew drastically. I remember the first time I saw him after I got back, it was like seeing a family member for the first time in a while. By the time I interviewed him again and had his wife also come in, I had grown emotionally attached to his story. I started to feel as he did. This journey of making John's doc has been an amazing one. I've cried with him over the brothers he'd lost and some of the stories he had shared, but I've also laughed with him at the funny stories. I love talking with John and Gail, and I love this class and the impact it has on the community. One of the greatest feelings is seeing your idea for the doc come to life. And my joy for this class has grown exponentially with my second year. This class gave me an opportunity to have a lifelong passion for something that mattered, and a lifelong friend who I wouldn't have ever met. Thank you, John, for everything. I love you, brother. Through the mud and the blood, the rain and fire, their faces leave a lifelong impression. The sounds will never leave, and the scents linger on. The shattering sound of silence calls out. The memories remain. We sit and listen, but can never truly fathom. Your silence pierces our hearts. You have done what was asked. You answered the call. We thank you and we care. The stories you share, the glimpse into your life, stays with us. It is over, but the faces never fade. We see the pain in your eyes and the joy in your smile. We stand here with you, willing to help with the burden. We will share your story. We will care for the ones that were lost. You share the names that stay. You bring life to those that are gone. The guys that never leave will find a place in us because we listen and we care. You will never leave us, joining the faces that never fade.